From the Cronkite Studios in downtown Phoenix, this is Cronkite News. Martha has changed her opinions very rapidly when she decided to run for the United States Senate. My record is clear and it's consistent, unlike my opponent. We're taking you inside last night's heated debate between the candidates for Arizona's U.S. Senate seat. Plus, they say an apple a day keeps the doctor away, but your Apple Watch may cause you to make a doctor's appointment instead. How these watches may not have accurate health information tonight. And how one organization is making it easier for adults with disabilities to hit the links with their adaptive golf equipment. Cronkite News starts now. Good evening and welcome to Cronkite News on Arizona PBS. I'm Jordan Daphnis. And I'm Matt Lively. Thank you for joining us. From health care to border security, the two candidates vying for Arizona's Senate seat faced off. Democratic Senate candidate Kirsten Sinema and Republican Senate candidate Martha McSally participated in their only live debate scheduled before the November 6th election. Cronkite News reporter Holly Bernstein joins us now in the broadcast center with a breakdown of last night's discussion. Health care, social security, and border control were just a few of the topics debated last night on Arizona PBS. During the debate, both candidates urged voters to look at their voting records. Last night's debate between Republican Martha McSally and Democrat Kirsten Sinema gave both Senate candidates the chance to speak healthcare, on several issues. Health care was one of the first topics. McSally says she supports coverage for those with pre-existing conditions, but adds that she does not support Obamacare. We move forward with uh, an approach that gives people tax credits and gives them options to shop around, more, uh, more small business support to have association health plans, more opportunity for people to uh, give to health savings accounts. Cinema primarily focused on McSally's voting record in her rebuttal. When Martha voted last year to repeal existing law, it would have eliminated the protections for people who live with pre-existing conditions in our country today. The debate moved on to Social Security. Cinema says she is against the privatization of Social Security and turning Medicare into a voucher system. The constituents that I represent and that I can, will hope to represent the United States Senate will depend on these benefits that they've earned. It's our duty to protect them for future generations. McSally says she is against the privatization of Social Security. She suggests finding bipartisan solutions to strengthen Medicare. Our seniors have been working their whole lives and they have been saving for retirement and they've been paying into Medicare and Social Security and they deserve to have the benefits that they had paid into. During the discussion on border security, Cinema said she would be okay with a physical border but says there needs to be more efforts with smart technology. Because the dangers we have around border security are too great to simply allow for an 18th century solution to a 21st century problem. McSally says there needs to be a secure border. But we've got to secure the border and close these loopholes that the cartels are trafficking people into our communities. Whoever wins this election will be the first woman to represent Arizona in the United States Senate. For continued coverage on last night's debate and all election news heading into November, visit cronkitenews.azpbs.org. In the broadcast center, Holly Birdstein, Cronkite News. One of the most heated moments in last night's debate came at the very end when McSally accused Cinema of treason. McSally claims come after a 2003 interview with her opponent surfaced last week, where Cinema told a radio host that she didn't care if he joined the Taliban. CNN reported that in 2003, while she was on the radio, you said it was okay for Americans to join the Taliban to fight All against right, us. We, I want to ask right that. now whether please. you're going to apologize to the veterans and what? me for saying it's okay please. to commit treason. We are running out of time. So Treason is a serious accusation punishable by life in prison or the death penalty. ASU history lecturer Peter Van Cleve lent his expertise on the matter and believes that the image of treason is more powerful than the charge through the Constitution. And this actually, I think, parallels nicely with the McSallian cinema. It's more about the accusation and the power of what that means um, than it is about the actual charge of treason and what it would lead to, right? And the charge through the Constitution and, and, and things of that matter. The last time someone was convicted of treason in the United States was in 1952 during World War II. A man was sentenced to death and President Eisenhower commuted that sentence to life in prison. 
During the debate, McSally also announced that President Donald Trump will visit Luke Air Force Base this Friday. The president will also hold a rally for McSally. After a visit to the areas impacted by Hurricane Michael, President Trump also acknowledged climate issues. There is something there, uh, man-made or not. I mean, there's something there, and it's going to go, and it's going to go back and forth, but there is something there. But again, uh, 50 years ago, it was brutal. 1890s were brutal. You have different times. And uh, the main thing is we have to make sure things get brought back to perfect condition. That's what we're doing. Many scientists disagree with the belief that climate change is cyclical. Instead, they assert that human activity is leading to the rise in global temperatures. Last week, the United Nations Scientific Panel issued a stark warning about the impact of rising temperatures, including coral reefs dying, food shortages, and worsening wildfires by 2040. One way to cut back on wildfires here in Arizona is to tame the forest. Efforts have been going on for almost a decade, but only a small percentage of the forests have been thinned. Part of this is due to high costs and dependency on the timber industry. I went to Flagstaff to learn more about the efforts. Thinning trees in the woods may not be the most glamorous job in the world. But tree harvester Devin Suarez has wanted to be a lumberman since he was a kid. I would always play uh, cars with my best friend and we, we would pretend that we had a logging company. Last year, the Four Forest Restoration Initiative, or Four Fry, hired Suarez to help them thin the forest in northern Arizona. Neil Chapman from the Nature Conservancy is part of this effort. Without well-informed loggers implementing this work, removing the small diameter trees, we're not going to get to the desired condition that we want on the ground. Suarez's goal, help prevent wildfires by thinning the forest. This helps keep wildfires from burning fast and hot and from getting close to communities. There's a lot of forest to thin, but it's hard for tree harvesters like Suarez to make a profit. The trees Suarez is contracted by the initiative to harvest are not the most profitable trees. Most are small trees that don't offer much wood. The small and medium trees that we're removing are just such low value that it requires a whole lot of certainty and time to recover the investment that it takes to build infrastructure like sawmills and logging equipment. These small payloads also make it difficult to find some place to process the wood. The closest working lumber mill is more than 150 miles away in Phoenix. So that gets pretty expensive on the on the shipping costs where we have to deliver that far. Four fries in the early stages of putting together a forest thinning contract that investors can bid on. They hope that this contract will work as a long term funding solution, providing sustainable local mills to people like Suarez as part of their plan to restore 2.4 million acres of forest over the next several decades. Our main concern is to prevent homes and other human structures from a severe wildfire that might actually burn some of those things down and threaten life and property. And if the forest is really dense and the forest gets, the fire gets up into the canopy of the tops of the trees and burns really quickly, then it could threaten homes. While they still have more than a million acres to go, over the past eight years, the initiative has thinned more than 185,000 acres. It's a very good opportunity to reduce fire risk where we can maintain the forest for future generations. The Four Forest Restoration Initiative's goal is to harvest 50,000 trees a year by 2020. This story is part of a series called Fire in the Neighborhood from Elemental Covering Sustainability. The job of mental health professionals is to be there to help their patients. Coming up on Cronkite News, how mental health field professionals provide support and help for each other as well as their patients. Next. And we talk to students participating in new projects around the valley that blend engineering and creativity to create social change. I'm Judy Woodruff, anchor and managing editor of the PBS NewsHour. The journalists of tomorrow face a fast-changing media landscape, but quality news remains vitally important to our communities, our country, and our world. At ASU's Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication, students learn solid, reliable reporting, holding the powerful accountable, and rebuilding the public's trust. The Cronkite School and Arizona PBS PBS, preparing the next generation for a stronger future of journalism. As journalists at Cronkite News, we report on stories that matter to you by focusing on the local impact. 
We dig deeper and work tirelessly to keep you informed. Live in Wickerburg. Live in Los Angeles. In Cleveland. In Washington. In Louisville. From Jerusalem. Live in Philadelphia. From around the world to right here in Phoenix. At Cronkite News, we report the facts and stick to the truth. Suicide may not be openly discussed, and those helping people through their struggles may be struggling themselves. Cami Clark explains how mental health professionals feel the pain of their patients' suicides. Suicide can affect those closest to the person lost, but mental health professionals are also impacted by the suicide of their patients. Psychologist Lisa Fisher explains the emotional toll that those in her field may experience. They become very guilt and feel very ashamed and they feel alone, not comfortable to talk about it. As mental health professionals feel the effects of their patient's suicide, psychiatrist Brian Espinoza explains how he checks on colleagues who may be struggling. Well, I do have a couple of physicians that I'm kind of concerned about, and occasionally I'll, I'll reach out to them, whether it's in the hallway, in the hospital, or give them a text, and just let them remind them that you know, I'm always available to, to talk with. According to the Center of Violence Prevention and Community Safety at Arizona State University, in 2016, about 56% of people who died by suicide in Arizona had at least one mental health problem. Impact Suicide Prevention Crisis Call Center Manager Dennis Therian says professionals who provide help also go through the grieving process. If there's not that awareness and people think because of maybe their status or professional position, it, they're not affected in the same way, they never get the help that they need and they're exposed to it more than most. Uh, so it's really important to acknowledge that so that opens the possibility to getting that help. While psychologists and other mental health care professionals feel the effects of suicide, psychologist Lisa Fisher has a support group where others can come and cope. Our job is to take care of other people. But we tend to forget to take care of ourselves. So when something very traumatic like your dad happened, we need to take care of ourselves as well. Regardless of your profession, Fisher says it's important to communicate your feelings and to reach out for help. In Phoenix, Cami Clark, Cronkite News. According to Psychiatric News, one doctor dies by suicide every day in the U.S. A rare polio-like disease that causes paralysis is affecting children across the country. The medical name is acute flaccid mitolitis, or AFM, and it's a growing health concern. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention said there could be as many as 127 cases. At least 62 confirmed cases have been reported in 22 states this year, and an additional 65 illnesses are being investigated. The CDC said AFM could have several possible causes. That could be environmental, genetic, or viral. About 90% of the cases are children who have suffered muscle weakness or paralysis, but most kids do recover. Wearable technology is being promoted as helping to monitor people's health. But does it? Cronkite News reporter Samantha Lomibau talked to Valley doctors who warned that a new Apple Watch may have benefits, but also some risks. The Apple Watch Series 4 is equipped with a feature built to track someone's heartbeats and detect falls. But one Phoenix cardiologist I talked to says the monitor could detect heart problems that don't exist or not detect a true health emergency. It also could be falsely reassuring. Somebody could be having symptoms of, say, a heart attack or other heart issues, and the Apple Watch isn't designed to detect those, and they may be falsely reassured. Dr. Todd Hurst says it shouldn't be your sole source of information. Mesa radiologist Penny Bowen says the fall detection feature, for the most part, is beneficial. So having the accelerometer and the gyroscope detect quick motions, it can dis differentiate between a fall and just the bending motion because of the speed that your wrist is moving and the sharp angle that it's taking downward. According to the World Health Organization, falls are one of the leading causes of accidental injury. When you have osteoporosis, if you have a fall injury, you're more apt to have a fracture. So this person was lucky enough not to have a fracture, but this is a typical site that we see fractures, especially when people try to brace themselves for a fall. She says there is a potential disadvantage with the fall detection. The feature will automatically call an emergency contact or 911 if there isn't a response within a minute of the alert. If we find that we're going to have a lot of unnecessary 911 calls when people are perhaps accidentally dropping their watch off their nightstand. Apple chief executive Tim Cook says the health features help people. In May, he tweeted media accounts of a Florida teen who said the watch revealed a life-threatening condition. 
He called her case inspiring. Dr. Hurst says physicians are excited for the potential patients to better access to their own health care information at the flick of a wrist, but it's good not to be swayed too soon by marketing promises. Samantha Lomibau, Cronkite News. A mock scenario may find a real solution for children with disabilities. Coming up on Cronkite News, how these students are striving for social change through problem solving next. It's a live look at the southwest region. We have seen a lot of rain and snowfall this morning. But I have more about our current temperatures coming up next on Cronkite News. I'm Ted Simons, host and managing editor of Arizona Horizon. The 2018 election season has arrived. Join us for primary and general election debates. Right here, meet the candidates and hear their positions. Arizona Horizon, your source for what matters most this election season. Only on Arizona PBS. Peoria High School is also home to the Met Professional Academy, an academy where high school students work in areas of medical, engineering, and technology. Reporter Tanaya Williamson met up with a group of students who are working on a project geared toward helping children with disabilities. The opportunity is immense. Holden Gardner is a senior at Ironwood High School. But he meets up with his STEM team at Met Professional Academy a few times a week to work on projects. The team was given a mock situation that requires them to improve the life of a person facing a disability. Their mock person is named Penny. And so we are looking at this model, this, like, this model, this mock situation, and trying to find a way where we can strengthen her neck muscles specifically, where she can look up, look around, and just function. The students at the academy receive help from teachers who provide guidance, but allow the students to call the shots. When our students get involved in their projects, we try to be as hands-off as we can. We want, them to f we want them to fail so that they can learn from the failure and end up ultimately being successful and know that they did it, not that it was handed to them. The students participated in the Makers of Change presentation of solutions hosted by Southwest Human Development. The Makers Challenge uh, brings together students from high schools across the valley uh, to support uh, some of the things that we're trying to solve at our ADAPT shop where we work with young kids that have severe physical disabilities. Several high school teams received prototype chairs from Southwest Human Development and met to present their solutions to a panel for a chance to win $500. And although the Met Academy team did not win, there was still something to take away from the opportunity not only presenting but also working with engineering students a little bit out of my comfort zone I learned that it's very important for to communicate and Phoenix Tanaya Williamson Cronkite News Met Professional Academy is part of the Peoria Unified School District which allows students from different schools to come together and work outside of the traditional school setting some parts of northern Arizona woke up to an early winter wonderland. This morning, snowplow operations were in effect on Interstate 40 and Interstate 17 in Flagstaff, the Arizona Department of Transportation said. And you can see there's a dusting of snow up at Snow Bowl. The National Weather Service predicted three to six inches of snow in Flagstaff and two to four inches in Forest Lakes. They also warned against hazardous winter weather driving conditions due to snow-covered roadways and low visibility due to blowing snow from gusty northeast winds. Now, Matt, we've been experiencing a lot of rain across our state this month, haven't we? There's been a ton of rain, and that's why we have Alexis in the Weather Center to tell us if there's any more coming up in the forecast. Good afternoon, everyone. Yet another cool day here in the Valley. We're sitting at 69 degrees right now here in Phoenix, hitting a dew point at 44 with winds blowing 8 miles per hour. It is interesting because this time of year last year, we were topping off with an average of 88 degrees, but our high temperature right now is 69 in Phoenix. And across the rim, we're sitting between a 30 and 40 degree temperature mark. 
And you can see this clouds and radar. We are getting rain and winds coming in from the east side. And we have seen up to three, over three inches of snowfall in northern Arizona up in Flagstaff. And for our high temperatures, what to expect tomorrow, it's 78 degrees here in Phoenix. It's starting to warm up compared to what we've been expecting the past two days. And then for the next eight hours, we are going to be pretty steady in the mid 60s. And throughout the week, we are going to be warming up, but still sitting below average. You can hear on Friday, we're going to be pretty sunny, 84 degrees. But in the weekend, we are going to experience some storms on Sunday, ending my week on Tuesday at 82 degrees. From the Cronkite Weather Center, I'm Alexis Liao, Cronkite News. A car accident three decades ago took away some of one man's sensory and motor nerves, but it didn't take away his active lifestyle. Coming up on Cronkite News, how this equipment allows those with disabilities to continue to hit the links. That's next. Here at Cronkite News, we have producers who craft shows that make an impact on our community. Our broadcasts allow students to be involved in all levels of production, from producing to directing. We are guided by highly respected professionals who mentor the journalists of tomorrow. From technical directing to teleprompting and beyond, our production crew works tirelessly to produce meaningful and award-winning shows. We are Cronkite News on Arizona PBS. I'm Matt Berry, ESPN Sports Center anchor and graduate of ASU's Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication. With its bachelor's and master's degrees in sports journalism, the Cronkite School is preparing the next generation of sports journalists to tell stories that matter, stories that excite, inspire, and inform. Cronkite immerses students in covering sports at all levels in one of the country's top sports markets. It's this hands-on experience under the guidance of award-winning sports media veterans that shape the top journalists of tomorrow. By the year 2050, there will be more plastic in the ocean than fish. Before Professor Halden, I had an insane amount of passion, but I almost felt helpless because I didn't know how to use it. Professor Halden gave me a chance to make a difference. Being at a place like ASU allows you to take these big leaps. Ultimately, the biggest problems in the world cannot be solved alone. With the abundance of golf courses in Arizona, our Justin Parm found out how some golfers with disabilities are teeing off. Balance, center of gravity, and impact are all essential for a good golf swing. So the very first time I hit the ball, I crushed it. I, it was straight and far, and this dude just looked at me and was like, kind of like, nice work, you know? And I just, I, you know, I wish every single shot could have been my, as good as my first one. A good golf swing for players like Tim Surrey requires more than just a good backswing and a steady grip. I got hurt in 1988 as a car wreck is what happened. Medically what happened is I ruptured my aorta and it killed my motor and sensory nerves. I remember being in the hospital and I remember looking around smelling all this great barbecue from a mouth wired shut and they set me a, a, a a shake, if you will. They ground up all the, the ribs and whatever, put it in there and set it in front of my, it, it right on my table. And right then and there, I knew if I've got to eat barbecue, drink it through a shake, I'm going to make it. Tim made it, but the recovery wasn't easy for someone who was used to being active. No way, I knew it. I'm sure it sucked to get hurt being in a wheelchair. I wasn't going to let it stop me. I was going to just go and go and go. And, and that's how I got through my rehab, and that's how I go through life. Determined to keep going, Tim started playing wheelchair sports, like track and field. In a 1992 meet, Tim took second place in shot put and discus. Now he also hits the links, thanks to the stand up and play golf cart, a piece of equipment that raises pair of athletes like Tim into a standing position. I've been playing golf for about three years now. Uh, the stand up and plays were introduced about three years ago got to go out and play with my buddies. And it was fun just hanging out. Carry out on! There oh. being, it, being with your buddies again, and this one actually stands you up. You can look eye to eye. Just makes, makes, you, just makes you feel real, real good. While access to adaptive golf equipment has grown, buying that equipment isn't quite as easy. And it could require someone trading in their car, considering a stand up and play golf cart like this one 
could cost upwards of $35,000. To help make the equipment more accessible, Ability360 bought stand-up and play golf carts and single rider golf carts. Use of both carts are included in Ability360's monthly membership fee of $35. When you're out on the golf course, you get it all the time. First of all, they come up and they see this machine that you're on and they're like, what, what is that? Then they'll look and they see it stand, standing you up. Oh. They're just like, holy moly. Then they see you hit the ball and they're just like right on. It's just kind of neat to see those people realize that, hey, you know what, just because I'm in a wheelchair, just because I've got a disability something, I can still go out and play with the best of them. While the stand up and play car enables him to play golf, he said it doesn't give him an advantage over golfers without disabilities. Oh, come on. Just being competitive gives me a drive to go out and be better, even on a golf course, you know, play my lie or how I can get a roll onto the green, something like that. For a lot of people, that's why they love golf. It's the challenge, whether it's playing a shot from the bunker or trying to sink a long putt. Get in, get in, get in, get in. Oh. The challenge is universal. In Phoenix, Justin Parr, Cronkite Sports Report. Surrey isn't the only golfer using these adaptive carts. Members of Ability360 are encouraged to test out the equipment and hit the links. Cronkite News is proud to be the news division of Arizona PBS. Arizona Horizon is next, and here's what's coming up on PBS NewsHour. I'm Hari Srinivasan. Can a college program about social justice build the next generation of inner city leaders? It's a bold, imaginative move to identify dynamic young people. Coming up next on PBS NewsHour. That's it for Cronkite News tonight. Thanks for joining us. For top Arizona stories anytime, go to cronkitenews.azpbs.org.